All right, so welcome everyone to our uh, CCNA security meeting for our ITC class. I'm going to turn off the my picture so you don't have to look at my ugly face and also so save a little bandwidth. The uh, couple things I want to talk about. First off, thank you for bearing with me over the past two weeks and for uh, me being behind grading a little bit. The uh, CCNA, or excuse me, the uh, Skills USA uh, contest was wonderful. We had really good contestants. Uh, even better, I think Cisco is going to find about four or five people to get to go to work for them, which would be really nice. Um, so it's, uh, it's useful for Cisco in that respect. But a very good contest. The students were excellent. Um, it seems every year the level comes up, which is it's something that's really good to see. I mean, we had years ago, we had students who couldn't hook a console cable in and make a console connection. Uh, we had none of that this year. We had everyone could do a basic config, which was, like I said, very, very nice to see. Um, and then we had some who were just fantastic, you know, excellent, excellent uh, students, both at the secondary and post-secondary level. And then last week was uh, was Cisco Live, and, and just a couple takeaways from there real quick. You know, Cisco uh, brought up their idea of basically the intelligent network, what they're talking about. So a network that can can kind of make decisions and do things for you without intervention of a, a network administrator, also provisioning things quickly. Um, they talked a lot about one of the big buzzwords at the show is hyperconvergence. Um, got to look at the VX blade from Dell, which is basically a an integrated system of Cisco UCS's Nexus switches and Dell storage all in one unit that you purchase. Um, super expensive, but super integrated. And also patches and things that go on it are only put in as a, uh, they're tested and, and, and you, they're insured they don't cause a problem with the uh, component when they roll out a patch or a firmware patch, which is it's pretty neat. So saw some good stuff there. Saw a lot, and this applies directly to what we're doing here. Saw a lot with firepower, which is a uh, really kind of a new uh, firepower threat defense and firepower um, uh, management console. Actually, one of the coolest things at Cisco Live, and I will tell you next year it's in Orlando. Uh, if you're anywhere near Orlando, and even if you're not, you need to go to Cisco Live because they've got really neat things. One of the coolest things I did is walk up labs. We could walk up and just do labs on certain technologies, and they had it on everything from uh, firepower to um, the Cisco CCIE route and switch, um, just all kinds of things. So I did I did labs for that. Uh, the only negative was is a line most of the time, which was kind of a pain. But the firepower lab I did was interesting because it's taken an ASA uh, adaptive security appliance that we'll be using in this class and connecting it to some more intelligence really than the ASA has now, and allowing it to do more in depth, um, more in depth filtering more in-depth analysis and, and look at what's going through your firewall. Uh, and then, it, it, to be honest, having the experience with Palo Alto also, uh, it's allowing the ASA to catch up with what Palo Alto is doing, at least begin to catch up with what Palo Alto is doing. Um, and no offense there, Patrick, but, you know, Palo Alto has kind of had an upper hand in that particular area uh, on their firewall side. But now the new firepower from Cisco is, is really leveling the playing field. So it's going to be a, it's an interesting time to see. Um, where security is going to go in the Cisco realm. Um, so again, I can't can't recommend enough that if you get a chance to go to uh, Cisco Live, uh, go. Uh, you know, spend the money. It's it's well worth it. It's super. This year, compared to years I've been before, it seemed like it was even more um, well organized. It was just uh, no problems with shuttles. Everything was dead on, spot on. Um, so it was really good. All right, now uh, I want to ask you, do you have any questions? Uh, I know one of the things I want to make sure we're aware of, and I talked to you all about this before, but when you go in to do a lab, uh, and here's a cool thing I'll show you real quick. If you do a schedule and you want to, you say, reserve it for yourself, now you normally reserve it for yourself. I have to do it for individuals. But if for some reason, Patrick, I'm going to pick on you here, but if you wanted to actually look at the labs beforehand, they are actually right here in the scheduler. So if you want to see what lab eight is, you can click on it and it'll pull it up. So you also need to be using the documents when you do your labs, simply because they may be modified from what is in the, um, the curriculum itself to fit in that labs. I want to also make you aware that once we get to chapter nine, uh, when you're doing the ASA labs, you're going to have to use the, um, you're going to have to use pod five right now for the ASA lab. So make sure when you do this pod, uh, 9312, uh, use pod five. There's only seven of you in this class. So you should be okay, but you'll notice this lab has been updated from that labs plus, but use pod five for the ASA lab. So nine, basically nine through uh, 11. Uh, and that will be, that will allow you to, to do that. 
Okay. Uh, obviously, uh, it will also even show you the skills assessment. We'll talk about that that you'll be doing later so that you can set that up and, and do some skills assessments. Uh, I've got that set up so you can do it uh, as part of your hands-on test. Now, uh, are there any questions? I, I do want to make a, you aware of Chapter 5. There were some issues with the package file and there's some issues with uh, the lab itself. Anybody, any of the three of you done Chapter 5 lab yet? Yes, I have. Okay. Did it work for you? Um, it worked, but I, I wrote you some comments about the problems. Uh, this is the one with the signature in the realm. Signature file, pub file. Yeah. So the, uh, uh, the application wasn't set up for the correct default for the TFT, uh, what is it? TFTP yeah. server. Yeah. You right. had to change the TFTP right. server. Right. Had to change it, but it wasn't the, the current uh, signature file that the book uses. Uh, it did work, um, but I could see how it'd be a little challenging, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, for some folks to figure out where to go to and. It is, and and honestly, if you if you did it on Pod Five, I've updated the signature pod on Pod Five and tested it, and it works. But I've still I've actually done this lab with both signature files. And I've had it work once, and then I've done it with the latest signature file and had it fail or act like it failed, and then it still worked. And so it'll give you an error message saying that uh, basically there's an error uh, loading the signatures, but it actually do, does load the signatures. If you go look in the flash, they're actually there, and you can turn them on and off. Um, so to be quite honest with you, uh, all the years I've taught CCNA security, the IPS stuff on the uh, on the on the routers has been a little finicky. Let's use that technical term, finicky. Um, so it will work uh, if you miss a step or if you mistype something. Uh, it can cause issues, and honestly, even sometimes if you don't, uh, there can be an issue. Um, and you know, it's kind of funny because I did a live again on Firepower and. One of the labs I did, which was really cool, was converting an ASA config to a Firepower config. And you had to do it through a Firewall, uh, Firepower Management Center and you turn it into a, a basically, a, it's a VM that's running the Fire, Firepower Management Center. And the first time I did it, went through it exactly the, the correct steps, it failed. We looked at it, the guy came over, we looked through it, it ran through it again and failed again. And then we did it a third time and it worked. So. Hey, that's why that's why Patrick has a job and we have jobs is because this stuff is doesn't is not the simplest thing on the planet. Sometimes it has little issues here and there. Um, but it will the IPS lab, when you start doing this with your students, be aware that lab out of all of these gives us the most problems. Uh, it is the one that, that really is a, a beast. The rest of them pretty much work. Um, but that one is 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 a pain. Any other questions on that one? I just want to make you aware of that one because, uh, again, it's kind of so – in some ways, I feel like that lab, because we're using a Cisco uh, a router as an IPS device, it feels kind of like we're trying to you know, fit a, a square peg in a round hole. Um, and so I, it's going to be interesting to see as they move forward to CCNA security and with firepower, if they'll kind of move that out of there and move the IPS stuff and some of that uh, straight up into the – what they're doing with the ASAs with the firepower software. Um, by the way, a uh, quick aside also, if you're buying security equipment for your lab, do not buy the 5505 uh, ASAs. Uh, the 5505 ASAs are end of life, uh, and the new 5506 5506-X is actually available as part of the Cisco Academy discount program. Um, so you can get those now, and they are available. So. Um, and if you need information on how to order gear, uh, email me and I'll put you in contact with one, a uh, couple of my vendors that I have that, that honored the, the Cisco, uh, Cisco Academy agreement. Okay. So that's just a real quick thing there for you to be aware. I am going to upgrade all of mine to 5506s as soon as they upgrade the curriculum and support 5506s. All right. Let's, uh, jump in real quick. I want to talk about VPNs today. I know, uh, chapter seven is actually the chapter for this particular week. But I don't really feel like I need to go through cryptographic systems with you. Um, the chapter seven that's in in the uh, in our course is reminds me a great deal of the cryptographic um, uh, section that's actually in uh, Security Plus. 
So I don't feel like I need to go through that. So I want to take you through and get you into uh, uh, into the site site or VPNs, so configuring VPNs. All right. So let's talk a little bit about VPNs. And if I'll click on the right thing, we'll be able to do that. You can tell I've been out of the office for two weeks. All right, so what is a VPN or a virtual private network? Um, I did a real, well, and I keep going back and I keep saying things about uh, uh, Cisco Live, but I did a cool out on DM VPNs, which are dynamic multipoint VPNs uh, using a next hop uh, routing protocols and, and just the, the ability, not next hop, but the the um, DM VPN routing protocol basically lets it set up a hub and spoke. But VPNs, as we look at them in this particular course, uh, we are going to talk about two major types. We're going to talk about a site-to-site -site and a remote access VPN. Either way, these VPNs are set up to allow us to have secure connections across an insecure network, be that the Internet or just anywhere that you want a secure tunnel. Um, it may even be a uh, big discussion I had fo with folks was about uh, the power industry, um, you know, VPN and into uh, – a portion of your network that is a SCADA control area, uh, you know, using that type of, of connectivity to allow that, uh, putting firewalls in between SCADA systems and the normal network, and then even more so the outside network. But we're looking here at, at our site to site, which is from an, a networking endpoint to a networking endpoint. And then we have remote access, which this is a mobile worker with like Cisco AnyConnect, or it could be a, a mobile worker with an SSL, um, VPN client, which is not really mentioned a great deal inside of this. Some of the benefits of VPN, uh, it is cheaper. You don't have to mo uh, maintain call-up or dial-up banks. Uh, anywhere you go, you can connect. Um, it's secure because your information is being encrypted and authenticated in some cases, many cases. It's compatible with almost anything, and it is scalable because, you know, as long as you've got enough bandwidth on the outside, you're uh, able to get into the network itself. We're going to talk about uh, a great deal about layer three IPsec VPNs. Um, you know, there are different types in the CCNA curriculum. There's the GRE, which is a generic uh, route encapsulation. So it's a, a tunnel that is not encrypted. Now, there's ways of doing GRE and IPsec and IPsec and GRE and all kind of weird things. Um, but we don't really cover that in this course either. Um, there's also MPLS, um, which is more of a layer, it's it's a tagging layer two, layer three uh, technology, and then so on and so forth. We are going to talk about IPsec VPNs, and IPsec VPNs really consist of a connection that requires two different security associations, two different primary security associations. We're going to talk about those in a minute, but they're ISACAMP or Ike, and also IPsec, and we'll talk about those two because uh, they are the two main things that make up an IPsec connection. So here we have remote access. This is a user at any point. So this would be your traveling salesperson who is uh, at a different hotel every night. Um, you know, it's us sitting at Cisco Live, us sitting at a conference and needing access to uh, our network. And we can open up our uh, Cisco AnyConnect client, uh, connect to the VPN terminating device, and then our PC appears to be a client inside the network. It even has an IP address that is inside the network for all practical purposes. The secondary site, uh, let's say you control where the user is coming from. So you've got a branch office or a remote office. You've got a dedicated internet connection there. Um, you can set up a site-to-site -site VPN. And that's the important thing when you look at these two is where the tunnel ends. In a remote access, the tunnel ends at the client. OK, so that client knows that there is a tunnel because the client has to have software on it to initiate the tunnel. And it can be you know, a thick client like AnyConnect or it could be an SSL client using a web browser. In a site to site VPN, the client doesn't even know that the data is being put into a tunnel uh, because the tunnel is being made by the endpoint device, which is in this case a networking device. It's also going to be when we talk about ESP, we'll talk about where encryption of the IP header can take place. Uh, in this type of scenario, you can't really rewrite the IP header because you don't have a device that can do that. Whereas with this, you can put a new IP header on it, 
uh, with ESP or encapsulating security protocol because you have an end device uh, that has an IP address on it that you can use. That's pretty much site to site. Uh, now, they do mention DMVPN here, and you can go and, and you can actually open up DMVPN and learn about dynamic multipoint VPN. Um, there's not much at all inside of the Cisco uh, CCNA security on it, but it's pretty much showing that you're setting up uh, a hub, and instead of creating uh, between every spoke what is a, a true IPsec tunnel or IPsec setup, you let the hub uh, or the the hub itself will will give information to allow the spokes to create uh, IPsec tunnels between them dynamically, um, and it's using the NHRP. Uh, it's using um, basically it, it's just a specialized way of doing uh, site to site VPNs without having to create every single um, site uh, statically uh, as you do your your. IPsec profiles and information. Okay, and it's really beyond what we're doing in in this particular course, but they they do mention it. Um, and the MPLS is worth looking at. So this is a concept that's kind of kind of important to look at when you're doing VPNs, and that's called hairpinning and split tunneling. This particular diagram shows hairpinning, which is if this VPN, these clients need to get to the internet, okay, they're already on the internet because they're creating a tunnel back to the corporate network. But if you have hairpinning enabled, these clients, in order to get out to the internet, say they're wanting to go to velonews.com to one of the tour stage today. Well, instead of being able to go directly there with a hairpinning scenario, they have to send all their traffic back to corporate and then it goes out corporate. And that would allow for control of the traffic that client A and client B are sending uh, through this tunnel, okay, or any any information. Basically, with hairpinning, all information on client A and client B, any data, would come back to corporate first and then go wherever it needs to be. So if it's dead at, uh, traffic going into the corporate network, it would come across this tunnel. And if it was traffic going to a public server, it would go in this tunnel, hairpin back out to the public server, and then come back and go out to client A. With split tunneling, it's a way of configuring your VPN so that, let's say that the client A is connected to the email server on the corporate network, all of that traffic would be encrypted in the tunnel, and if they're streaming the Tour de France uh, on, by the way, I'm a cyclist, if you didn't notice. Um, if they're streaming the Tour de France from a public server, that information, that data would not have to go through this tunnel and be encrypted. It would just go out on the public server. And so that's really a corporate uh, decision as to how their policy is going to allow their traffic through their VPN tunnel. Any questions about that? Any comments? Speak up, Bob, Patrick, Klinger, if you've got any comments at all. I don't want to bore your senses. No, this is good. This is good. I don't know if you saw, they just released the AnyConnect 4.5 today to do some more of the uh, dynamic split tunneling. Oh, really? I did not see that. I did not see that. I know right before uh, Cisco Live, y'all released the new Nexus 9K switch. Um, that was pretty funny because I, I tried to actually go see it, and there were so many people swarmed around, and I couldn't even get to it. I was like, only at a geek conference. Was, was it the Nexus 9K or the Catalyst 9K? It was the Catalyst. Sorry, Catalyst 9K. Yeah, yeah that was a huge announcement, yeah. But you know, it was a small. It was smaller than I thought it would be. Um, the one I saw, anyway. But I think it was, you know, one of their little um, four slot or six slot. Or, it was small, but yeah, there was um, a diff different size. I think there's a. I thought I saw a ten slot, but I, I could be mistaken there. Yeah, it, it was like I said. It was so funny to have the uh, the uh, everybody all around it looking at it. So. I didn't mean, to, didn't mean to sidetrack there. No, that's cool. That's cool. No, I'm, I'm, uh, well, here, here it is. You can see it's, it's actually a small box. It's not. It wasn't very big. Yeah. So, um, which is nice that it's not as big as the 6500 and 60, you know, 68. Um, but yeah, they announced that. That was that was neat. Now it's got to find somebody to buy one and put in the lab. <laughs> right. The. Um, 
in IPsec, well, one of the things to think about with an IPsec tunnel is IPsec is not a single protocol. Um, IPsec is a group of protocols used to create the tunnel, used to maintain the tunnel, used to, to ensure that the information is secure, and then the inf what's needed to tear the tunnel down when it's all over with. Now, if you start looking at the IPsec framework, we're going to look at a couple things we can use. We're going to discuss each one of these in detail, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time right here. But basically, you've got different protocols that you can use to determine um, what you're going to do with the, the header portion of the IP data as it's being placed into the tunnel. Basically, as it's being placed in the tunnel. We're going to look at confidentiality, how we can ensure confidentiality, in other words, encrypting the data. We're we'll looking at integrity, so hashing, how to make sure the data is not changed in transit. We're we'll going look at authentication, so how do I authenticate the two devices that are creating the tunnel with one another? And the two are pre-shared key and RSA, um, which is Rivest, Rivest Shamir, and Alderman. And then DP Hellman, which is one of the most confusing parts of IPsec, uh, and I'll do my best to explain that to you. Uh, I'm not a mathematician, but I'll give you my definition of the math on it. So. But what you're going to find out is in when we start looking at uh, setting up IPsec tunnels, one of the very first things I always tell people is one of the first things with IPsec uh, VPNs, one of the very first things is this. You've got to define interesting traffic, okay? So that interesting traffic is actually – now, let me ask you something. What is the one thing that Cisco uses for every single thing in the iOS, it seems like, in some form or fashion? If you think about, you know, I know it's IP address and all that, but if you had to think about a concept from CCNA that goes through access control, firewalls, route maps, policy maps, uh, what are in every single one of those pretty much? ACL. ACLs, yeah. So we're going to use what's called a crypto, if I can spell it right, crypto ACL. Now, what this crypto ACL does is it doesn't block traffic. It defines interesting traffic. In other words, that is, when I say interesting traffic, it is what traffic will bring up or initiate the creation of a VPN or an IPsec tunnel. Okay. Hey, Annie. So an IPsec VPN, the first thing we're going to need to do when we're actually configuring it is we're going to define interesting traffic that will bring up or initiate the creation of an IPsec tunnel. We're then going to set what are called Ike or Internet Key Exchange, okay, information. And this is going to be policies or profiles. And here's what I want you to remember. Here's, you've got to get this in your mind. Ike equals ISACAMP. Because all the commands start with ISACAMP, and it's Internet Security Association Key Management Protocol. I think that's correct. I'm close if I'm not there. Um, but we're going to have Ike profiles that we have to set, and you have to have a matching set of Ike profiles on both sides for phase one of an IPsec VPN to come up. So that's, this is basically here what's called phase one. We then go to phase two, and this is where we're going to have our IPsec profiles or security associations. So I'll say uh, just right now for profiles, I'm going to use that word. And this is IPsec phase two. Okay. And this is what we're going to see. Some of these protocols, okay, for instance, here's a security association. This would be a profile for IPsec and Ike. So in other words, we're saying with IPsec, we're going to use authentication headers. And because uh, an ESP plus AH, in order for two devices to actually create an IPsec tunnel, they must share a matching set of IPsec profiles. So Ike and IPsec. So let's kind of keep that in mind as we move forward, because that's what all these protocols are for. It's for that negotiation of a tunnel. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but confidentiality is encryption. So we take information, we encrypt it with an algorithm. We send the crypto text, uh, crypto text across uh, the internet. Uh, bad mean hacker person can't see it. We decrypt it on the opposite side. So here's our encryption algorithms. 
Uh, Leak Secure is DES. It's been broken for some time. Triple DES has been broken too. AES, these are all different ones supported by Cisco. And then SEAL is also another one. So it's a stream cipher, stream cipher, excuse me. Um, and so it's 160-bit SEAL. And I think it actually you can go above that now. Be aware that if you don't have a K9 image on your devices, you will not be able to use uh, VPNs. And also be aware that when you download images that are uh, cryptographically enabled, um, you're agreeing that you will not export them to certain countries because they are considered weapons by the United States government. Other items we're going to talk about is the hash algorithm. And what we do here is we don't, this is just to ensure integrity. So in other words, we take the information, we run it through a hashing algorithm like MD5 or SHA, we get a hash. We send that hash to the other side, let the other side run the exact same um, hashing algorithm against the information. If the two hashes don't match, well, then you know the information has been changed in transit. MD5 is no longer secure, so I really would not use it very much. And then SHA is what we'd want to go with it. So MD5 is least secure, most secure. By the way, there's a reason they're showing you these from least secure to most secure, because they're going to be asking you questions on those, possibly on the CCNA security exam. So be aware of that. And then authentication, pre-shared key is a way of sending basically pre-shared or having pre-shared keys on both sides. It's always aggravating because with pre-shared keys, how do you share that key with the other side? Um, do you call them on the phone? You can't email it to them unless you can encrypt it in an email. Um, so pre-shared key is less secure than using public-private key pairs. Um, pre-shared key, however, is much easier to set up uh, than uh, public-private key pairs. So that's what we use in the lab as a pre-shared key. And here we have pre-shared keys. And basically, you've got the key. You hash it or you encrypt it, send it across. And then this is for authentication instead of encryption. But you can do the same thing with, with uh, encryption. Here's pre-shared keys. You've got the public or the private key. You create a digital signature. You send it across. And then only the public key can decrypt that digital signature and prove that the digital signature was created by the private key. We did actually, a, it, there's a command that will allow you to see the RSA key on a Cisco router. It's show crypto, uh, show crypto key RSA. Um, we'll show you that key. So, And then this is Dippy Hellman. And this is the one that I will be absolutely honest with you. It's part of our, um, of our ISOCAMP setup. And Dippy Hellman, this is the way it's been explained to me. And maybe, some, maybe one of you will have a better explanation. Maybe you're a better math major than I am. But basically, you've got a problem, and you need to share a secret key. Actually, you need to create and share a secret key without sending that secret key across an insecure link. So how do you do that? Well, Diffie Hellman basically, and, and here's my math mind for you, creates a, uh, a big number and then uses that big number as a seed for another number, which comes up with a secret key that the other side can also uh, basically, using elliptical curve cryptography, which is lollipop cryptography, uh, can actually create the same thing on the opposite side and the two agree upon it. Um, Folks, I'm sorry, that's, a, that's the best I can do uh, with Diffie Hellman. I've read and, and read, um, but basically, here's what it's used for. It's used to create a shared secret key that each side can have without sending the key across, um, which is very interesting. Okay. Um, again, if you've got a better explanation, I'm all ears, because uh, I would love an easy way to explain this to my students, because um, there's not an easy way for me to do it. Anybody? Okay, good. I'm glad I'm not the only one. But notice how they've got an activity. If you do have a good way, let me know. Okay, here's what I teach my students. If you see something once, they go through it multiple times, and then, lo and behold, there's an activity on it. What does that usually tell you? Test question. Bingo. Ding, 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 ding. So uh, I would be very, uh, very aware of this chart and also know how to put it together from least secure to most secure so that you know, um, you know, what they are. Um, and I believe, uh, 
ESP plus AH. Confidentiality would be DES, triple DES, AES, and SEAL. Uh, integrity would be MD5 and SHA. Yeah. Authentication is RSA, it's the most secure, pre shared key. And you got Diffie Hellman 1, 2, 5, and 24. 5 and 24. That might not be bad to put on a sheet and kind of lay out and, and, and know. And stress this with your students, because like I said, it's important. Now, when we look at, uh, here's something else that, believe it or not, I, I have seen in various or sundry questions on the chapter exams, too. The AH uses protocol 51, and ESP uses protocol 50. Now, the reason that is is so you can write, uh, in case you're using these, you can write ACLs that allow them. Uh, be aware, and here's how I remember it. AH starts with an A, which is the first part of the alphabet. So you would think that would be 50. But no, it's 51. And I know you're sitting there going, he's crazy. But that works for me. AH is 51. ESP, which you would think would be 51 because it's later in the alphabet, is 50. You got to pick your own way to do it, but that's how I do it. Um, AH is 51. ESP is 50. Um, it's what I consider to be backwards because you'd think that with AH comes first on the list, it would be 50, but it's not. 51 and 50. Um, We'll talk much more about these two here shortly. Like now. So authentication header, what do you have? You have with authentication header the ability to authenticate the IP header on information going through a tunnel. Now, this is only authentication. This is not encryption, okay? So basically you're getting a header. So you take the IP header plus the data plus a key, creates a hash, that hash is put in. And you'll notice you've got your your original IP header, so the IP header is not being rewritten. AH has this authentication information in it, and it's sent across your tunnel. On the opposite side, the receiving router takes that authentication header, runs it with the key through uh, the hash algorithm of AH, and boom, if the received hash matches the recomputed hash, then you assume that this particular header was not changed in transit. Now notice that is not encrypting it whatsoever. It's only authenticating it, ensuring that it was sent from who said sent it and it wasn't changed. ESP does something different. ESP can actually rewrite the packet and encrypt the entire header and data information as part of the uh, tunneling. You can also use AH plus ESP, so you can do both. Now here's an example of encryption and authentication with ESP. So you see here, you've got, uh, this will be a site-to-site uh, -site VPN where you've got your original IP header, okay? When it gets put into the tunnel, you rewrite that, put an ESP header on it. You encrypt all of this, which was the original data that you had, put an ESP trailer on it. You've got ESP with authentication, and you put a new IP header on it. So you're rewriting the IP header. Now there's a way to do this also with ESP that doesn't rewrite the header, and that's the difference between transport and tunnel mode. By the way, transport mode is the mode used with remote access VPNs. So if I'm at a hotel, I don't control the router's IP address that I'm coming into my corporate network from. So if I'm using ESP on my AnyConnect connection, I can't rewrite the header because I don't even know what the IP address will be for this tunnel. So what I do is I take and use ESP to just encrypt the data, okay, authenticate that data with this ESP authentication, and then put the original header back on. Now, if I'm in tunnel mode, I control the device. So I know what the outside IP address is going to be. It should be a static IP address. And so I can actually go in and make a tunnel using a fully encrypted original packet, okay? And then put an ESP header on it and then put a new IP header on it. Does that make sense? Make sure again you remember that AH does not provide any data confidentiality. ESP does provide data confidentiality. 
And there again, you can have AH in two modes too. You can do the same thing, do it in transport or you can do it in tunnel mode, depending upon whether or not you uh, uh, are using a remote access VPN or a site to site VPN. Now, Ike, remember what I said, Ike equals what? Ike equals Ike can. So when I say phase one, which is Ike, we're going to go do a bunch of commands, and every one of those commands are going to be isocamp commands, pretty much. Um, so be aware of that. Don't get confused. Ike equals isocamp. Um, key management protocol. And we're going to look at how you can you can actually negotiate an Ike SA, uh, which is a security association, which is required for phase one of the tunnel. So let's look at this. First off, now it says phase one. The very first thing that's going to happen is what I told you, and that is something's got – some traffic's got to be interesting first. And that's one of the, the, the very interesting things that I find with people is that they set up Ike right, they set up IPsec right, they set up their VPN crypto ACL wrong, and they don't understand why their VPN tunnel's not coming up. And I'm like, it's because the traffic's not interesting. If that crypto ACL does define it as interesting, you then will drop down into Ike phase one. Now, you can have multiple policies on devices. So you can have 15 policies on uh, a hub router and 15 different policies on spoke routers. As long as the hub shares one policy with the spokes, it will work. It will actually negotiate an ISOCAP policy. So here's your ISOCAP policy. In this case, we're using AES uh, encryption, SHA for hashing, pre-shared key. And we're using Diffie Hellman 14, and this is security show. Uh, excuse me, security association lifetime uh, variables have been set. That's how long the tunnel will stay up without re renegotiating um, the security association. It then goes down and does the Diffie Hellman key exchange. Again, that's where it does the big number and ends up generating a shared secret key on both sides. Verifies the identities, and once this ISACAMP SA comes up, then you will go to phase two which is going to be our IPsec policy. Now, IPsec has a couple modes. You can have quick mode or main mode, uh, and really it just comes down to how IPsec is going to be doing its, uh, its um, tunnel negotiation. Uh, Ike version 2 supports what's called NAT transversal, so if you hear anything about that, you can kind of look at that. But for us, it's a little beyond the scope of the uh, CCNA security. So here's our IPsec. You'll notice. You get interesting traffic, step one. We're then going to negotiate phase one, which is Ike, which again means that you're going to have to look at your ISACAMP policies to make sure they match. Once phase one is done and you've got an Ike um, security association, then um, you'll go to Ike phase two, which is when you start your IPsec security association uh, creation. And then once that's done, you'll have your tunnel. And then the tunnel will stay up as long as the uh, tunnel is not terminated or it times out or some other reason makes it go down. Kelly, quick so, question for you. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. Of the Ike policy number, that's, is that what it uses to initially uh, exchange to, to match, like, hey, I need to be looking at this particular policy? Yeah, it will go down through the numbers based upon the numbers. It'll try policy 10 first, then 20, then 30, then 40. Right. So basically, let's imagine that uh, on my spoke, uh, policy 15, or let's say the spoke only had one policy, policy 10. The hub over here had um, policy 40, uh, and that matched policy. They don't have to match on the two ends. So the hub and spoke, the policy number is only locally significant. What's important is that the inside variables for that security association match. Okay, that's what I, I couldn't remember. That's sort of like OSPF process ID then, right? It's just locally Correct. significant. Okay. Yeah, it's just locally significant. That's all it is. Now, I will say this. When a connection comes in, it will, let's say on on our case here, the left was with policy 10. Let's say there was also a policy 1 through 9 already. Um, it would actually look through policy 1 through 9 first to see if it matched. And if none of those match, then it would try policy 10. Gotcha. Okay. So. All right. So we've done that. So site to site. 
Now let's look at configuration because it's really pretty easy. Um, it's it's a little long, but it's easy. All right, so we're going to do this. We're going to uh, number one, and here's something I always say: you configure the ice cap policy for phase one. You configure the IPsec policy. You configure a crypto map that that applies the IPsec policy. Then you apply that to your interfaces because it has to be applied to the interfaces you want to be the tunnel endpoints. Then you verify its operation. Now be aware in here, I also usually put in a step of creating the crypto ACL, um, which they use as part of there. So they just, they kind of have that outside of the thing. Um, here is a ACL. Let's imagine you're doing filtering on the outside interfaces. Again, when you look at this, these are connected to the internet, right? So you've got some kind of firewall policy or some firewalling going on right here, okay? On these two devices, you've set up um, context-based access control list. You've set up, uh, you know, just packet filtering something. If you're going to set up tunnels between R1 and R2, they've got to accept on both sides IPsec and ISACAMP. So you'll see here, you've got to permit the ISACAMP traffic, access list, ACL number, permit, uh, UDP source, destination equal ISACAMP. Then you need to permit ESP, so you can permit ESP source destination. And that's, you know, if you're using ESP and AH. So this is uh, encapsulating security payload and uh, authentication uh, protocol, excuse me, and authentication header protocol. So you can see here, you have a an ACL extended inbound. You're permitting, you know, that coming in, and that's actually this inside site here. You're permitting ICMP from host here to here. And then you're allowing the tunneling information. So you're allowing ISCAP, ESP, and AHP. Now, if you've got to do broadcast or multicast traffic across a, um, a tunnel like this, uh, most of the time you've got to put it in GRE. Um, GRE supports uh, multi-protocol tunneling. One of the negatives of IPsec tunnels is it only supports IPsec or IP. It doesn't support uh, multicast, it doesn't support uh, broadcast, it only supports IPsec unicast traffic. Um, that's where we kind of get into putting GRE in IPsec. Um, so you can actually create a GRE tunnel and then put that tunnel, that tunnel through IPsec. So that's beyond, again, beyond the scope of CCNA. Um, that's more of a CCNP topic. So what are the default policies? If you do a show crypto, and by the way, everything on a VPN pretty much is show crypto something uh, when you're creating uh, VPNs, but you just show crypto ice cap default policy, and you will see that by default, the encryption algorithm is AES, the hash is SHA, the authentication method is, um, you, um, they changed something here. Oh, here, they've got all different types on this one. Um, but they've got multiple different ones that they allow. So here's a, 65507 that's got RSA and this lifetime in seconds, okay, and then ASA. So they've got some built-in default uh, schemes here that you can connect with. Now, if none of these default policies match what your company needs or wants, you can define your own ice camp policy. And so you can go in here and you can say crypto ice camp policy one or 10 or whatever, whatever number you want to give it. And you can then set your hash algorithm, your authentication algorithm, your Diffie-Hellman group, your lifetime, and your encryption. And they mentioned the mono, uh, mnemonic Hagel or Hagel, uh, hash authentication group, um, lifetime, and encryption. All right. So those are items you can set. And there's a good video here that you can watch. You can watch Keith Baker's video. So we want a policy for XYZ Corp that has SHA, pre-shared, group 24, 3600 seconds, and AES. So we can go in here and do crypto ice cap policy one, has SHA, authentication group, lifetime. Now, that then becomes policy one. If we want to create that tunnel with R2, R2 is now going to have to have a matching ice cap policy that sets all of these items the same. Okay. So we would do that, we'd go over there. We do have to create a pre-shared key since we have set our 
ICAP policy to be a pre-shared key, authentication pre-shared. We then go in and say crypto ICAP key, key string, which is just some string, address peer address, and this will be the address of your next hop neighbor or where you're, well, not next hop, it would be the address of your endpoint VPN neighbor. Which, by the way, you've got to have reachability. You know, you're, you're seeing this and you're saying that this can go over here, um, but all of this would have to be taken care of if these were not on the same network, which they are on, looks like on slash 30 network. But if they were not, all of this, and they don't have to be, this could be on a totally separate network from this side. It would just have to have reachability in some way, BGP, uh, static routes, whatever. Uh, it had to have reachability. And then you've got crypto key, ICAMP key, key string host, peer name. You can do it either way. Um, if you do that, the um, host name has to then be uh, set where well, you can look it up with DNS or it has to be set with a host table, one of the two. Uh, we typically I just use the peer address. Um, so we we'll go in here and we we'll go crypto ICAMP key, blah, address, blah. And on the opposite side, notice it's a mirror image. It's the same key, but the destination is the opposite side. So we're going to each side. In fact, uh, and these are the ones where it actually shows you, it's just a little syntax checker that you can do. Now I'm going to define interesting traffic. We've got to set up and say what is interesting. And here is our crypto ACL. So right now there's no SA. We're going to set up interesting traffic. We're going to say that 101 permit 10100, okay, to, um, and this is on R1, by the way, 1921680. So any traffic from here going over to here is going to be interesting. Now, what do you think we're going to set up on R2? What's the ACL going to look like on R2, the crypto ACL? They look about the same, except that they have the IP address on the other side. Exactly. They're going to be mirror. The one on R2 will be a mirror of R1. It will be access list permit IP 192.168.1.0210.010 um, because it's going back this way to make sure the traffic. And that happens. I see this a lot when people start doing VPN tunnels. And they'll put the same crypto ACL on both sides. And the tunnel comes up, and you look here on R1, you see packets being encrypted, but they're not being decrypted. And the reason is it's only being encrypted one way. The pings aren't working. The traffic's not working because when it gets to the opposite side, it doesn't know what to do with it. It can't come back. Um, it can't be encrypted back or be de-encrypted. So we've set our ICAMP policy. We've set our interesting traffic. Now we're going to set our crypto IPsec transform set. Now this is really your IPsec policy. And if we look at it, we can see that here are all the different things you can use for a transform set. So we can use AH, MD5, we can use ESP, uh, triple DES, ESP, all types of things. In this case, we're going to decide to use ESP. It can either use ESP AES or ESP uh, with SHI HMAC. So either one of those are two, or those two are acceptable. It's going to use both. Okay, so we've set our transform set. And there's crypto map, map name sequence number, okay? And that's what you assign to it. Uh, and that will allow you to change an existing crypto map if you happen to be creating one. What type, if it's going to be IPsec, uh, ISACAMP, which means it used phase one, or if it's using uh, manual ICE initiation, um, which I've not seen anywhere in the real world. Now, I could be wrong, but I haven't seen it. So uh, almost everything I've seen is ISACAMP. IPsec ISA camp. So this is crypto map R1 to R2 underscore map 10 IPsec ISA camp. And then now we've got to set all the different items that are part of our IPsec configuration. Oops, sorry. Here we go. Crypto map match address 101. This, guess what this is? It's the access control list number. So it says anything that matches this crypto ACL, use this transform set, which was uh, ESP, uh, AES, and ESP SHI HMAC. The peer is 72322, so it's over here. Perfect forward security, that's a way of doing security with um, um, additional security on the on the tunnel. Again, that's another one that's kind of a little beyond the scope of this. And then the security association lifetime of 900 seconds. 
That's how long the tunnel will stay up, or not the tunnel, security association will stay up uh, without being renegotiated. On the opposite side, you're going to do the same thing. So you can do a show crypto map, and you can see your crypto map. You can see the ACL. You can see if perfect forward security set, what DP helmet group set, what transform set is there. Then we're going to apply that crypto map to the interface. So we're going to say R1, R2, put that map right here. So anything that matches this that's going over there, we should be encrypting this. Now on R2, you're probably going to create an R2 to R1 crypto map. Then you send interesting traffic. Now notice, here's where people get in trouble too. They put all this in, and then they go to R1's CLI, and they ping R2. And the tunnel doesn't come up. And they go, well, why didn't the tunnel come up? I'm pinging from R1 to R2, and it's working fine. Well, let's go back a second. What's the crypto map? When is the tunnel going to come up? Looking at this crypto map. Anybody? Yeah, interesting traffic on the access list 101, right? Correct. So if I went just to the command line on R1 and pinged, the source would be 172.32.1 over to 172.32.2. In that case, it doesn't match the interesting traffic. So again, remember this crypto ACL doesn't permit or deny any traffic in terms of actual traffic exiting the interface. It simply says, when I see this traffic, create a tunnel or initiate a tunnel. So, so we have to do ping IP, source it. This is our destination, the 1.1, source it from 10.0.1.1. Now notice it failed one time. What do you think? It, it honestly just took a few seconds for, or a few milliseconds for the tunnel to come up, okay? And then once the tunnel is up, you can do show crypto isocamp SA. You will see your ISACAMP or your phase one association active. You can then do a show crypto IPsec SA. And this is where I really show people you need to drill down. You can see the number of packets encapsulated, number of packets encrypted, and number of packets decrypted. Those should match pretty much because what's being sent should be encrypted and decrypted on the way back. You can also you know, go on down and see what type of mode it's in, tunnel mode. Uh, all the way down and looking items inside of there. And honestly, folks, that's VPN. That is, in a nutshell, how you create a VPN. So again, configure the ISACAMP policy for IKE Phase 1. Configure the IPsec policy. And as part of this, by the way, you're doing your crypto ACL. Do the crypto map, apply that map, and then use interesting traffic to bring it up. Are there questions on IPsec VPNs? I like the lab for this chapter. I like it a lot. It's fun. I like um I like IPsec. It's 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 kind of neat. Guess I'm weird. I like IPsec, but it is I like to see the tunnels come up. I like to send traffic across the pings and watch the encapsulate or the encryptions and decryptions work. Okay. Are there any questions on the class at all right now? Uh, Kelly, I had a question. Um, uh, I had another issue with uh, the VLAN labs. Okay. Okay. On the pod I was on, um, it um, I couldn't do the uh, algorithm type uh, command. The S script. The S script. Yeah, for for the script, uh, right. and I couldn't get into the configuration mode for licensing to, you know, upgrade to the demo or anything like one of the labs allowed to. So I don't know if it was that particular that pod or not. Uh, it was a switch. Uh, the router was okay. Uh, so. Um, is that, is that an issue you've seen before? I just I use the, the enable. I, I just use the secret instead of the, S you know, the, the script enable. You know? That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, I've, I have seen that issue before. Uh, it may be that that pod doesn't have the it should have the latest iOS on it. Um, 
I'll have to check it and see, but I think I, I've seen it before. Uh, I did check it. It, it wasn't the uh, level of the book. Oh, it was um, not? Okay. Yeah. Okay. It yeah, should have so been. Uh, if you can figure out which pod you were on and let me know, I'll check it. I'll, I'll see yeah, it. that's the one thing. I wrote you a bunch of notes, and then uh, I, I'll do that from now on. I'll check the pod I'm on. Yeah, and it's, uh, well, it's you'll, you'll be able to see what pot I was on. Yes, I, well, I no, because it doesn't show me in the scheduler. That's the one thing I hope they add to the new version. Oh, okay. um, it, it shows me all your labs you do, but it does not show me the actual pod you're on, which is extremely aggravating. Um, okay. I wish it did. Uh, you, you may want to give some people that I don't know a heads up on. I mean, basically, I just use the. Yeah. You were trying to do license, but I'm looking at your lab now. License boot module, license. Okay, you're on the switch there with the S script. Right. And it worked on the on the switch. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll go check it. I think I can figure out from this where you were at. All right, I left you some notes, but that's all. Sounds good. Okay, sorry about that. I mean, you can just do it. It worked on the switch, not the router. I see. I see. Yeah, I'm kind of, kind of peeking at it now. I can see it. No, it worked there. No, I thought it was. It, I thought it was a switch that it didn't. Yeah, it worked on the router. Yeah. Yeah, I just used the. Uh, there it I didn't is. Use the it. script. I just used the. Yeah, just used the. Yeah, just used your regular. Yeah. You know. Yeah, the license boot module command will not work on the switch, uh, not on the twenty nine sixties anyway. Yeah, the lab book was, I think it, I think this was like, uh, I, I know it was a lower level. I checked the IOS. So it's fifteen point zero two SE. Yeah, it may just be a, a problem with the lab trying to have you do a, uh, trying to do a command that it's not supported on twenty nine sixty. But I'll check it. Thank you. Sorry about okay. that, Bob. Yeah, no problem. And Andy's asking, well, I have a recorded version of these sessions. Yes, I'm going to have, I'm recording right now. And uh, when I turn this off, uh, it takes a little bit for it to, to process, but I will have it up on YouTube as soon as I can get it up there. So in fact, any, I'm going to stop the recording. Any other questions before I stop the recording? No, thank you. I'm going to stop the recording.